guest today is Laverne Stewart. She's a journalist, an author, and a mom, and a small business entrepreneur in a way. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Great. So let's dive right in and talk about the books. As we were warming up, you were talking about how the most recent work just kind of poured out of you. Yeah, I've uh, taken a bit of a break away from the newspaper in the last few months. And in the last five weeks, uh, a complete novel. Uh, I was writing eight hours a day, uh, every day. And um, it's the working title is Coven of the Soul Sisters. It takes a look at um, women who were persecuted, accused of witchcraft, tried and executed uh, in the late 1600s. Uh, that's the first part of the book. And the second part of the book uh, takes a look at a group of women who uh, discover they're the reincarnated versions of the women who were persecuted <laughs> for witchcraft. It's all about ho holistic medicine and and the how people uh, are persecuted for thinking that isn't in mainstream. So to sit there for five weeks and it pours out of you eight hours a day, you must have done a fair amount of research before, or something must have been the input before for that to come out. Is it a lifetime worth of gathering information? No, not at all. I was. It was a Sunday morning, and as we normally do, we have a big cook breakfast. The family gets together for a big cook breakfast. So I was in the kitchen doing my normal thing. I was frying up the bacon and <laughs> making the pancakes, and a title came to me. I was Coven of the Soul Sisters. What? <laughs> yeah. And then the 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 you know the story outline it just uh, you know I saw it kind of as a movie in my head, you know, that just the story just kind of unfolded as I was making breakfast. And then um I just started writing and it, uh, the character names I had it it just all flew. It just came out. It, the strangest thing I've never experienced that before. You know, I've written two other, three other books, and uh, I've always had to do research. You know, it's part of who I am as a journalist. You know, you do your research, but this one just flowed. Did it spook you at all? It excited me. Mm. Yeah, it was just. It was like I was driven to write it. Mm. Uh, and I, was, I wasn't quite sure where it was going. I'd go to sleep, I'd wake up, and I'd have the next chapter ready to write. It just was in my head. So I, I've never experienced that before. Maybe other writers have, but it, that to me was, it was all consuming. That was all I thought about for five weeks as I was writing it. Mm. So it was fun. Somewhere in there you had the opportunity of time then for the five weeks you could focus on it and... So that meant your daily life um, didn't intrude too much. No, I, uh, you know, like I said, uh, 2017 was one of the hardest years of my life. We had um, two deaths in the family within a span of four months. Very, uh, very difficult for me because they were... Uh, two very close relatives, uh, one of which I considered a second dad, that affected me greatly. Then we had a number of health crises in the family, uh, and I, uh, I was a primary caregiver through a lot of that. And then as a mother of teenagers and, you know, and uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of work pressures, it all just became too much. So I had to step away and just regroup. And part of the regrouping, uh, I find uh, writing is good therapy. And I poured uh, a lot of my pain from the last year into that writing. It, uh, it really was cathartic. Wow. Wow. So people be warned about eating breakfast at Laverne's place. <laughs> <laughs> the pancakes were very good, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating, and that it sustained itself for five weeks. That's that's a stretch, uh, pouring the energy out, and and still it's exciting you. And oh yes, it and uh, so so that manuscript uh, is going to be sent off to my publishing company, who I work with. Uh, they're based out of Ontario, a uh, Manor House Publishing, um, <clears throat> and it it will be published next fall. Hmm. 
this book here, uh, Haunted Heart, is my first fiction, mm -hmm. and it is due in stores uh, March 15th, so it's just coming out. This one is, um, that was fun, It was my it's my first fiction, and uh, uh, it's um, a mystery romance. And there's two elements. It's um, it's an historic fiction, the first part of the book, and then then it's uh, there's modern day characters. So the protagonist is a woman. Her uh, her name is uh, Sarah Harrison. She has inherited a sea captain's mansion. She lives in Boston. Uh, her only connection to the place is that she was brought to this place. She lives in Boston. The sea captain's mansion is in St. John. Her only connection and her only memories of the place are bad ones because, you know, as a child, she was brought there. She thought it was haunted as a kid. You know, it was a, it's an old, spooky sea captain's mansion. So um, she has no desire to do anything. She doesn't want to live there. She just wants to uh, renovate it and and put it on the market, make some money and, go, and return to her life in Boston. So the story unfolds of what happens when she moves her life from Boston to St. John and spends the summer in the port city renovating, restoring this huge property. And, um, and it's so, I like to say the book is, it's a little spooky. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little funny. Mm -hmm. and it's a little naughty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it's just fun. It's just a fun read. Yeah. So the romance part, does she meet a local and, and so, fall in love? Or is so, that giving away too much? Uh, so there's a struggle between, uh, so that there is a, she, so she doesn't want the place. Hmm. But there's a an Irish Canadian uh, ho housekeeper who's in her late 70s who uh, emigrated to Canada and um, is living there. And she doesn't want the place sold because, you know, she has a, 50 years of her life invested in this place. She doesn't want it to be sold away from the, the, her, this woman's ancestors. So she is trying to intervene. And uh, the man who does the restoration on the property, uh, as it turns out, is the ants. So I, I need to backtrack. The, the woman who inherits the property, uh, her ancestor is, uh, is uh, Evelyn and Evelyn uh, has a tragic romance back in the 1800s falls in love with a horse trainer um, and they're not allowed to be together because of social class and because of the difference in religion mm. and her father a sea captain says no this will never happen they have a tragic situation they both die and so the spirits of the ancestors are trying to bring the modern day characters together. And there's a lot of conflict between the two modern day characters. Um, so the old uh, Irish housekeeper is trying to be the intermediary because she's also psychically gifted and sees spirit. And so she's trying to bridge the two, the ancestors and the modern day uh, people together to right the wrongs that were done in the past through the present. Yeah, so. That's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah, I can't it, tell you what happens no, after that. No, but you've already given away a lot of yeah, the story, yeah. but it's good. Um, the book can be found online? Uh, it is online. You can purchase it online. You can purchase it uh, as of the middle of this month uh, in stores across Canada and in the U.S., um, and I've got about 500 copies, so if anybody <laughs> wants to contact me, I yeah. can sell them directly and, yeah. and make sure I, I sign them if they want we'll to put be signed. A, good. We'll put a link on when the show goes up sure. so they can find you. What's it like, um, the shift? So it sounds like there's a shift that's occurred in your life from journalism side to more production on, on the book writing side? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been a journalist for 30 years, hmm. and um, it was my passion. And, uh, you know, as you evolve in your life, sometimes passions change. I've really connected with the creative writing side. Okay. Journalism and creative writing are two different animals. Yeah. Uh, I will always love journalism, but I, I just really 
really am um, creatively excited now by the the process of of novel writing. What was your first book, the one about angels? Angels in the Afterlife uh, was published in 2010. It was a bestseller. Um, and it's people are still buying it. It's still available online. If anybody wants to go to Amazon or Indigo, they can purchase it online. Hmm. Um, and I believe, you know, it, they can purchase it either uh, in an e-format or they can yeah. order printed copies. See. And... Uh, and then there's this one, who, this book, uh, Healing After Homicide, the Jackie Clark story, uh, was a, a labor of love for me. It, uh, so if anybody knows uh, this child, um, or if they've never heard of Jackie Clark, an eight-year-old child was abducted in, in Fredericton uh, here in Nashwaxis in 1995 and I was working in television at the time and I was sent to the search scene mm -hmm. uh, along with uh, many other reporters and um, that day uh, her remains were found. She was abducted on a Saturday and her remains were found on a Monday. And <clears throat> I had lost someone to murder two years prior to her abduction and murder. And I had no idea how that would affect me. I had uh, buried uh, the feelings I had about my friend's murder. And and all of the other emotions um, that I had over, you know, two decades of going to crime scenes and accident scenes, a lot of repressed emotion about seeing the, the, the effects of violence. Uh, I had no idea how affected I was until uh, it was 2010 and uh, I had met a woman at, a, um, it was a fundraiser for uh, the Her Haiti earthquake and um, she introduced herself as a psychic medium and said that she had some things she needed to tell me and so we agreed to meet and uh, she started talking about uh, a child who uh, she saw in spirit um, and I wasn't really quite sure what to make of any of that but mm. so we agreed to uh, to meet and uh, she told me that this child um, wanted to speak to her mother immediately I, I knew that it was Jackie mm -hmm. um, and I thought well I'm not sure what to do with all of that and she said well uh jackie says she wants you to contact her mother because she's trying to talk to her mother and her mother's not hearing her and she's not seeing the signs she's giving her and and she wants you to call her mother up and tell her this and i said uh no okay <laughs> first off that's crazy second off no mother who's lost a child is ever going to want to hear from a reporter who covered her daughter's abduction and murder i'm not doing it i'm not inflicting any more pain on that woman that she's than she's already had why would she want to hear from me 15 years after the fact just let it go and um three days uh it you know it was in my head i couldn't stop thinking about it i wasn't sleeping well and so i called this woman up and i said i don't know how to find this woman uh the psychic i called her up and i said i don't know how to find jackie's mother and even if i did i wouldn't know what to say so she said uh, well jackie says it's in the file you'll find her in the file and then it came to me, oh, the, the file we've kept at the newspaper of all of the newspaper clippings of that case. And sure enough, I, it clicked. I said, okay, I'll go to the phone book and maybe, you know, maybe the, her stepdad, uh, I'll try and find his name. So I did. And uh, I said, well, I still don't know what I'm supposed to say. And she said, you, you it'll come to you. And she said, trust me, Jackie's mother is more okay with this than, than you are. So I remember calling. She answered the phone, uh, Jackie's mom. And I said, uh, first thing out of my mouth was, please don't think I'm crazy. And I'm sorry <laughs> to bother you. And I don't really remember what I said after that, other than, look, 
this there's a psychic medium who has told me that the spirit of your daughter wants to talk to you and uh here's her name and her number she doesn't want anything from you other than to pass the information on i am sorry i bothered you and good luck with that and goodbye and i thought you know i've done my job three hours later i get a phone call from the psychic saying Jackie's mother has been waiting 15 years for this. She has been searching for a way to make a connection. And she wonders why it took 15 years, but um, she's glad that you made the call and she's going to meet with me. And I said, good, I hope that she gets what she needs out of that. And uh, she said, well, she wants you there. Hmm. And I said, why me? And she said, she, she just wants you there. Mm -hmm. So um, we met a few days later, and I describe it as it was a it was a holy moment. I I can't tell you the I can't put into words the the feeling in that room, but um, it was clear that that woman uh, Jackie's mom heard things only she, only she knew about her daughter private things that there's no way anybody could have ever known um right down to the fact that she got a tattoo of angel wings with Jackie's name on her shoulder and uh I've, you know private things between the two of them and um I met with Jackie's mom, Tammy, a few days later. We had lunch, and I said, how are you now? And she said, I'm good. Uh, she said, it felt <clears throat> like she was carrying a heavy, wet blanket around on her shoulders for mm -hmm. 15 years. Mm -hmm. Just the weight of that. And the, She said, I feel lighter. It feels like it's been lifted off my shoulders now. Mm. And um, so from there... There were about, you know, dozens of other people who had uh, also had issues around that case that needed to hear messages. Yeah. So that's what this book is about. To interject just a bit, and we'll pick up that thread from there. Thank you for sharing that. The moment after the holy moment is done, some people watching the show might be on their own threshold of that leap of faith, that leap of belief that this is real. Mm. What was that like for you and for Jackie's mom with in that moment, and you described it so that you could feel it, but then when you're driving home or when you, you go back to three hours after that moment and you're starting to integrate into normal space or everyday space, um, do you have any recollection of that or can you share w what that was like? It's like, well, that just happened, but you still have to figure out how to process it, accept it, integrate it. It was, um, oh, gee, now we're, we're talking eight years ago yeah. that that happened. But I remember feeling this sense of peace um, and just a, a knowing that, I mean, unless you experience it, it's really hard to put it into words. But it, uh, I felt a sense of peace. Uh, but also an, uh, a sense of urgency. This, uh, this little girl, um, very determined, you know, and, and that's how her, her mother said she knew it was real because I described her daughter. Now, I had never met this child in life, you know. I, I feel like I've come to know her in spirit, um, over all of these years, I, I like to think of her as a, a long distance Facebook friend, you know, just <laughs> I, I, we've never met, but I feel like I know her. Yeah. Uh, there, I described her daughter's personality hmm. to her mother. And she said, that's exactly who my daughter was in life. Very determined, you know, had to get her way, had to have the last word. And over the three days before I agreed to contact her mother, this is this little, this, it was like this child, uh, you know, I want, I, you know, can I have, and, you know, and please, and, you know, just, you know, the way children are, they <laughs> nag until they get what they want. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, she was pushing me and pushing me. I had the sense of, if I don't do this thing, I'm never going to get any peace in my life. Like I said, I wasn't sleeping. It was just this feeling of, I've got to call this woman. And then after, after her mother had such a healing experience from the messages she received, then the psychic told me there are many other people who also are hurting, who haven't let go of the pain of this child's death, who need to hear hmm. what they need to hear. There's messages that this uh, spirit wants to tell these people. So uh, her teacher, her best friend, police officers on the case, uh, search and rescuers, all of these people were left with this uh, pain uh, and trauma that they could not release. So it started with her teacher, hmm. um, Shirley Dale Easley, lovely lady. She's since passed, but she held on to so much grief and trauma. She had to be the rock for all of the children, all of the parents, other teachers. She, When I met with her, she was in her third uh bout of cancer and the cancer had no known origin and I said to her do you think that uh, it, we often hear that emotional trauma will lead to physical illness I said do you think that the your illness is associated with the stress and the trauma of that case uh, and the loss of Jackie and she said I know it is um, and I said did you ever release the pain? And she said, I never did. I had to put it away. And she said, it's buried deep. And I said, it's time to let it go. So she heard messages and I heard back from her and she said she was at so much peace and she, she along with uh, Jackie's best friend, who struggled all the way through from eight years old until I'm, you know, it, a good 20 years of uh, 15, it was 15 years of um, pain and struggle and, and difficulty in her life and anger. And she's so good now. She's moved on and she's happy with her life and she's in a good relationship. And she has a daughter who she named Jackie. Um, police officers who told me they were the lead investigators on the case and they told me um, out of all of the traumatic cases they covered this one was the one they couldn't let go of I sat with police officers who um, the mention of her name would you know bring them to tears and they could not talk they were just you could see the trauma and they were shaking and they said this is the one that we can't let go of um, and so they too went and went to the psychics, got the messages they needed to hear. Hmm. There were two psychics I worked with on this case and, uh, on the, on the, getting these, uh, these people, uh, the messages they needed to hear. Are you okay to mention them or is it okay to leave it unsaid? Oh, well, one, um, one was, uh, Michelle Russell, uh, and then, um, another Suzanne Riley was instrumental uh, if it wasn't for Suzanne um, this probably wouldn't be finished um, I'd lost track of Michelle Russell uh, through the process of this and and Suzanne stepped in and helped out uh, quite a bit to okay. to get the messages that these people needed to hear so somewhere in the journey of this young child and all of those around her the image of a police officer, a male or female, doesn't matter, but there's a certain way or process that they do things to make the next step to go to see a psychic, to find the answers to things and to find some peace to things that they couldn't find in the everyday life. That Did they need, did they need a nudge? Or was it okay that, that they could go through that threshold and see the world through a, a different well, uh, paradigm? There were there were three police officers, four, four police officers. The first police officer was uh, the officer that uh, was there when her body was discovered. 
and he had to stay with her remains uh, while the other searchers were sent back to the command post to inform everybody that her remains had been found. And um, he he had struggled with that because he had just come off a major case involving child abuse, uh, the Carl Toft case. And he wasn't even supposed to be working. He was supposed to be on vacation. And so he said he had... He was there, and uh, he called his his uh, wife at the time and said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how to do this. He was just emotionally destroyed by it. And um, she said, just pray. And so he, you know, he said, you know, if you're out there, God, help me. And it was silence, and he took that as, well, I guess he didn't hear me. <laughs> yeah. And he, he was pretty angry. And he carried that anger uh, for a long time. It, it was affecting him and his career. And uh, in the book, he, he tells about how he was so angry. Um, you know, he was doing things that were self-destructive. And then uh, at a company Christmas party, uh, Michelle Russell, the psychic, at that time, was working for the Frederick Police Force uh, in administration uh, as an office administrator or, you know, a, um, an executive assistant. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she approached him and she said, please don't think I'm crazy, but there's a little girl in spirit around you and she needs you to know some things. And so she just told him all about Jackie and how Jackie's spirit was around him and that he was full of anger and pain. And she needed him to know that um, Jackie was uh, in spirit, in a really good place, that she didn't feel pain when she was killed. She was, her body, her spirit was pulled out of her body before she could feel that physical trauma. And he told me that that changed him. Uh, it turned his life around. He had gone to see a, a priest afterwards, and the priest told him that in his whole career, he had only heard one other uh, situation like that. He thought, you know, this is real. And, uh, and so it completely turned that officer's life around. And I said, where would you have been if it hadn't been for that? He said, uh, I wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be working as a police officer. Uh, I probably would have been fired because he was doing some very self-destructive things. You know, if he wasn't working, he said, he told me he was drinking, you know, to try and ease that burden, that pain and that anger. So, yeah, he, he was completely changed by the experience. And then I went searching for the other police officers, uh, one of which I went to his office and um, he had left the force at that time and was working in another field. And I told him, I said, this is going to sound odd to you, but uh, there's a, a child in spirit, I'm told by two psychic mediums who uh, are reaching out to people who are stuck in a place of grief. You're one of them. And he, at first, was like, you mean to tell me that the spirit of a dead girl that I, investig I investigated that case is reaching out to me from the other side, from beyond the grave, to send me messages? He said, that's crazy. He said, I don't believe that. That's nonsense. And I said, okay, well, you know what? Here's the psychic's number. I'm leaving it with you do what you want. He said, I don't have anything. There's no reason for me to contact her. And he said, do you think that I need to contact her? I said, look at you. I said, you're shaking. You've had to stop three times. You're crying. You got some issues in that. He said, it's the only case that I, I, I can't talk about without getting upset. I said, well, you know, what would it hurt? You know, go see. And if you choose to, great. If not, it's completely up to you. But I think that you have a lot of trauma in your life that you need to release. So I wished him well, 
I went on my way. Later found out I was only there. I had only left the office about 10 minutes and he picked up the phone and made the call. And he was in the office. He was meeting with the psychic that afternoon. I met him about a year later. Everything about that man had changed. Physically, he looked different. He looked lighter. He was happier. He was smiling. The first time I saw him, he was not smiling. But uh, he said it, it, it did affect him. It changed. It changed his perspective on things, and and he, it allowed him to release a lot of trauma. And another officer I met with, um, he, he didn't have that same level of trauma but it was so good for him to hear that uh, Jackie's spirit was saying thank you thank you for being there for my mother for being so careful uh, and so um, approaching it with such a loving kind uh, gentle manner that people who go through trauma need to be wrapped up in uh, love and tenderness in one of the most horrific times of their lives. So after the police officers, um, what other people um, became part of this new, almost a community um, through the actions and the events and the healing? Oh, um, like I said, search and rescue were workers. Um, one, uh, one woman who uh, was also experiencing the trauma from that case. Um, other uh, other kids who are now ad adults, yeah. but uh, other students in that school, other parents, um, one, one, actually, this is interesting. The the uh, one of the lead homicide investigators, his nephew was with Jackie and Jackie's best friend um, when she was abducted. So what happened is these three children had gone off to play at a frog pond near the school. And Jackie and uh, her best friend Robin, they were having a sleepover at Robin's house. It had been raining all weekend, and she had been there for the weekend, and they were bugging Robin's mother to let them go outside. That, that's back in the day when kids actually liked to go outside and play. Um, so they, they were bugging the, uh, Robin's mother to let them go uh, out, and she said, well, just stay in the yard when it had stopped, ra finally stopped raining that weekend. Just play in the yard. Well, they wanted to get to that frog pond. They loved it there. It was where their teacher, uh, Shirley Dale Easley, took them on nature walks. And they knew there were tadpoles in that pond and they wanted to go collect them. So they snuck off to the frog pond. They weren't supposed to go, but they did. And um, Robin's mother was uh, playing cards uh, on Saturday evening and she got caught up in the card game and then she realized that it was time for the kids to come and inside and get showered and go to bed and uh, they weren't in the yard and she had sent her husband out looking for them and he, she said I bet you they've snuck off to that frog pond I told them not to but I know that that's where they went so she sent her husband at the time uh, to go searching he found Robin uh, and um, Matthew, the the little boy, um, on the way back from the frog pond, but Jackie wasn't with them. And he said, where is Jackie? Well, she already left, they said. And they lied and said she had gone home. They were worried that Jackie was going to get in trouble for getting on an all-terrain vehicle with a man. So Murray Lyons is the man who abducted and murdered Jackie. He showed up on a four-wheeler while they were at the frog pond, and he suggested to them that one of them might like to take a ride with him on the four-wheeler. Well, um, Matthew and Robin um, said no. You know, they had just had that conversation in school about not going with strangers. And 
Jackie was fascinated by that four-wheeler. She had never been on one. She wanted to go for that ride, and he promised he would bring her right back. So she got on, and she went for a ride. Hmm. And um, so they, it wasn't until late that night that um, Matthew disclosed to his parents that she had gone off on a four-wheeler with a man, with a strange man. Yeah. And the search began. Yeah. So those two children, now being older, did they have a moment with a psychic to Robin, uh, yes, Robin, uh, Jackie's best friend, um, met with uh, one of the psychics about a year after um, her mother and her teacher. It took a while to find her. Yeah. And... Um, it was also, the only word I can come up with was it was a holy moment. Yeah. It was something that you you cannot put into words. Yeah. But it, 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 she also heard things that only she knew about her best friend. And um, it, it just changed her. Uh, I met up with her a while later and she said, I, you don't know what this has done for me. It has given me closure. It has given me a sense of peace. Uh, and um, she has moved on with her life. Um, she struggled for years with anger and pain and grief. And being able to release all of that uh, has really changed her for the better. She is, um, like I said, a mom of uh, two children. She's happy. She's working. She has a good relationship she's in a uh, relationship with a man who, who you know she loves dearly and things in her life are good um matt um didn't actually meet with uh either of the psychics but i relayed information to him um that was given to me for him and and it's also helped him uh another man who was the last person to see Jackie alive. He was fishing at a, um, at the stream where they drove through the Nashwalk stream. And um, he always felt that he should have stopped that man on that four-wheeler if he'd only known what was going to happen. And he blamed himself. Um, he since became a firefighter he, uh, because he wanted to help people. Uh, he wanted to be someone who intervened in an emergency. So he became a firefighter. And, um, but he always thought about, you know, Jackie and what he should have done or could have done. And the messages he heard helped him realize that nothing that he could have done would have, uh, affected the outcome of that. And, um, there's so many people <coughs> in that book. That so following that line of thought, and thank you for sharing all that, you wrote a book about it. So what was it like for you? Oh, uh, this, that, <laughs> uh, you know, writing for me is, is uh, therapy in many ways. Uh, like I said, I, I had lost a, a friend <coughs> who was like a brother to me. His name was Donnie Bro. He was a chef in St. John who worked at uh, an uptown restaurant, Vito's, an Italian restaurant. Yep. He was um, on his way home uh, after midnight um, when uh, he was stopped by someone who was high and drunk and wanted a cigarette. And my friend said, well, I don't smoke. And, you know, it ended up in a fight and my friend was never one to back down from a fight he ended up having his jugular uh, his jugular slashed and uh he was uh the knife uh, cut him from his navel to his throat so he bled out and um he he died very quickly i was the i was uh working in television at the time in st john and the uh the news director said you're on you're on that case that murder case i went to the scene not knowing it was my friend 
So I saw his blood all over the street and the crime tape, and I was interviewing people about what they may have seen. And um, we get back to the studio, and we're filing for the lunchtime newscast. And my camera operator uh, at the time, Murray Titus, said, I have the victim's name. He's a tall, redheaded guy by the name of Donnie Bro. And I just lost it. Hmm. I had seen Donnie uh, four o'clock. He was on his way to start his shift. He said, I missed your birthday. I'm going to come to your house tomorrow night. I'm going to cook you a belated birthday supper. And I said, that's great, Donnie. I'll see you later. In my, in my mind's eye, I can still see him. I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and he's waving goodbye to me. Yeah. That's the last time I saw him alive. I carried that trauma for years, along with, like I said earlier, all of the cases I've ever covered of murders of, and accidents and violence. And so this not only helped me release the pain I had from covering this case, but all of the other cases... And the anger and the trauma of losing my friend. Hmm. Been very cathartic. So you could pour all of that into the details and connections. For yes. The, the Jackie Clark story. I met with um, Donnie's mother while I was doing the research for this Healing After Homicide book. And I said, how are you? And hmm. she said, I'm good. I said, how can you be good? I'm not good with this. I'm still angry. I, I, I want to get the guy who yeah. got your son. She said, you know, when you hold on to anger, it's like a poison. Mm -hmm. the, you, 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 you're expecting the other person to die from the poison you've swallowed. Mm -hmm. So you're not causing them any harm, but you're harming yourself. Mm -hmm. I said, so how did you let go of that anger? And she said... Uh, she said she had a friend who was going to see a psychic medium in Ontario. And she said she cut a lock of her hair and she gave it to her friend. And she said, see if this psychic has anything to say to me. But don't tell her anything about me or what happened to Donnie. And so the, her friend came back home and she met with her and she said, the psychic told me to tell you to let go of the anger and the grief because you're never going to get over your son's death until you do. She didn't know anything about her son's death. She didn't know that the woman was angry. She didn't know anything about that case. So she said she went to bed that night and she prayed about it and she said, God, help me release this anger. Help me get over it. Help me to forgive the man who murdered my son. <laughs> And she said it was just gone. It was just taken from her. She said, I stopped being angry right there and then. <laughs> and she, sa she said, I forgave his killer. Not for him, but for me to let go of that anger. Yeah. And she said, I am good and I've been good for years. And I said, well, I'm not good. I'm angry. I, I wish the man ill. And she said, you got to let go of that. Because if you don't let go of it, you're never going to get on with your life. She said it's like anger and, and is like a cancer that eats you inside. Mm -hmm. and, and it was through the writing of this book uh, and hearing the messages I needed to hear. I, I'm, I, I'm able to talk about my friend's <laughs> murder and all of the other cases without becoming emotional, without crying, and I've released the anger and the trauma and the grief. Yeah. Do you think your books and your uh, writing that way, not the journalistic writing, but the, the book writing, do you think it happened in sequence for a reason? I almost want to take them and go, okay, so we do Angels in the Afterlife, then we do the Jackie Clark story, and now comes the fiction. Oh, um, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, because I don't think I don't think things happen in life randomly. Uh, there's, um, as I look back on it, yes, because Angels in the Afterlife opened me up to the possibility that there is an afterlife, that we are more than just this body, that this is, this is the shell, this is the container, but this isn't really who we are. Who we are is spirit. 
Um, and so the writing of that book allowed me to see that when when this this ends, this body ends, we carry on in energy, whatever, however you want to describe it. Uh, so that. If I hadn't written that book, and that book, you know, is a, a chronicling of all kinds of people's experiences with what they say are angelic experiences and experiences with spirit in the afterlife. If I hadn't done that one, I would never have been open to writing this one. So, yeah, the Angels in the Afterlife book opened me up to the possibilities and allowed me to you know, just be open to the, to the whole idea of this, which led to this one. And I had never been able to write fiction, ever. I've always been a nonfiction writer as a journalist. And um, now I'm opened up to writing fiction. I was frustrated by it, and I, and I, I had prayed about it. And I said, God, I don't understand why you give me the ability to write, and yet I can't write what I want to write. And it was um, it was a sense of knowing. It was almost like an audible voice, but not. It was just um, a knowing in my spirit that it was like, you haven't been called to write fiction. You've been called to write the truth. So um, I let the idea of fiction writing go. Wrote Angels in the Afterlife, wrote the Jackie Clark story. And then with the release of that, it was like, okay, I am now, for whatever reason, uh, opened up to, you know, all of this is coming out of me now in fiction writing. And um, so Haunted Heart, I wrote quite a while ago, but, uh, you know, just revisited it again. And, and this last one, Coven of the Soul Sisters, uh, like I said, it just came very quickly, which is <clears throat> the, going to be a trilogy. The next one um, takes a look at the repression of people in Ireland um, when the um, country was populated with Protestants by uh, Henry VIII decided he wanted to populate Ireland so he could control that country um, once the Reformation happened. So that's the, the second part of the book. And then the third part of the book will be uh, a look at the Great Famine in Ireland and the immigration uh, to Canada and the U.S. Do you feel like you're arriving? Oh, no. No. Life is not, uh, you know, it's a journey, right? Yeah. And so I'm... I'm on another. I'm on another road, as part of the journey. But uh, I don't think the journey ever ends. I've never. I'm not. No. I'm not. Uh, and I don't think even as an old lady, I'm not going to sit back. <laughs> I mean, I'm. I'm getting there. But, <laughs> but you know, I don't think I'm ever going to stop. You know, there are people who say I can't wait to retire, so I can sit back. Yeah. yeah. I hope that I am. You know, 99 years old and still writing. Yeah. And life is a journey that keeps going until you take your last breath. And then it keeps going further because, like I said, we're not this. This is just the yeah. container, the vessel. Yeah. It's connected, but maybe in a slightly different direction. You're doing all this in New Brunswick. Yes. <clears throat> is it working to your advantage? Or, or is it a good place for this to be happening? I mean, in a way, it's obvious it is a good place for it to be happening because it is. Uh, one of the larger social narratives are, you know, the challenges of trying to create um, your career in this province, and we tend to give it a negative tone. Um, the joy of doing these interviews is all these people who are being successful while living in New Brunswick and their work is being spread all, all through the world. Well, uh I think, you know, you make your life wherever you are. Yeah. And, you know, if I were living in Toronto, first off, I wouldn't be writing because I would be a miserable person living <laughs> in a large city. I am not meant to be a city mouse. I'm a country mouse. Yeah. And I love living in the middle of the woods on a lake uh, near Fredericton. And um, I don't think I could be the creative person I wouldn't be inspired to write New Brunswick. I was born in Nova Scotia, but 
my heart has always been New Brunswick. Uh, my dad's family came to New Brunswick um, from Ireland um, a couple of years before the the famine happened in Ireland. And um, so I'm a fifth generation uh, Irish, Scottish, Canadian. My mom's side of the family is, is Scottish. We, I spent every summer in New Brunswick on my family's farm. Um, and every holiday I could get from Nova Scotia to New Brunswick. And I moved to New Brunswick to start my career in television. I had uh, started as a summer replacement reporter for CTV in 1988. And they offered me a full-time position uh, in September, provided I moved to St. John. And I jumped at the chance. I thought, New Brunswick, awesome. I'm only an hour away from my family's farm. That's great. So I moved to St. John and um, lived there for five years. The inspiration for Haunted Heart is the sea captain's mansion I lived in in St. John when I was working in television. I swear that place was haunted. <laughs> Honest to God, there are pla things that happened in that house. Uh, no. I don't know. I Maybe, not sure, but is a little creepy. Mm. Uh, so then I met my husband. Uh, we were um, in 1992. And he was working um, at the Irving Oil Refinery. And uh, it was shortly after Donnie's uh, murder. And I decided life was short and I was going to live it. So wanted to do some adventure things and scuba diving was one of them. So I went off to learn how to scuba dive, met my husband while scuba diving. And he is a Fredericton boy. So I thought I was going to die if I had to stay in St. John and he was going to university here um, in, in Fredericton. So I asked for a transfer and the television station transferred me to Fredericton in 1993 and I've been here ever since. So New Brunswick has been exceptionally good. Um, I don't think that I would have been where I'm at in my career if I'd been in another province. I, who knows? Who yeah. knows? But to be able to do what you love <coughs> in the place that you love, that's a blessed life. Yeah. That'd be a good place for us to stop. Okay. <laughs> thank you for this. It's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.